Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Mormon Movie Reviews, where LDS movie lovers belong. My name is D. Vase, and today is October 8, 2022. This is episode 34, and we will be reviewing Bitter Wind, a running time 30 minutes, released in 1963. This review works best if you've seen this film before, though that is not required, and a spoiler alert. Your synopsis. Billy is a simple Native American shepherd boy living on the Navajo reservation. His father, George, heads a tight-knit and prosperous Navajo family who starts to occasionally drink with his friends, coming home to a tongue lashing from his wife, Nellie. A gifted silversmith, George gradually begins to neglect his work, which provides much of the family income. Then he begins to sell off horses, goats, and pawn his silver jewelry to pay for his habit. Billy leaves his childhood home to further his education, while Uncle Bitani chides George about his drinking, but to no avail. At first, Nellie begs George to stop drinking, but eventually she starts getting drunk as well. Billy returns from school, and he finds that Old Aunt Desba are the only ones who is left to look after the needs of the younger children. They face hunger and the bitter winds of a harsh winter. With fleeting hope, Billy searches for his parents, hoping to find redemption. Now, this movie opens here with a scene of Uncle Batani, who is gently waking Billy from his slumber. Now, my understand is that most of this movie was shot on the Navajo Reservation, which is mostly in northeast New Mexico and also in Arizona. Billy and Huzza Uncle have a beautiful relationship. Billy gets exercise and takes a lamb with him. And this lamb, it represents the innocence of his life and of his ideal existence. Billy also narrates much of the film. Here he reminisces about his close relationship with his uncle. He taught me not to steal and not to tell stories about what I didn't see. Gossip is bahadzit or dangerous. He taught me not to gamble because in the end I would lose and get nothing from it. Now, many Navajo during this time raised sheep and other domestic herds uh, in the 1960s. It was one of the few industries which was available and uh, plentiful on the reservation. So many people then lived with crushing poverty and despair at that time. I mean, and even still some today. Now, here we get to see Billy's small village and are briefly introduced to most of the main characters in this film short. Those were the happy days. My mother and my old aunt would weave beautiful rugs and my father would make jewelry of silver and turquoise. With the rugs and silver, we could buy food and many useful things at the trading post. Now, George's success at home allows him to buy luxuries that many others could not afford, including alcohol, which was banned on the, reser banned on the reservation at this time and it is, is still banned even today. Now, as someone who has seen the horrible effects of alcoholism firsthand, I can tell you that this portrayal here is pretty accurate. Finally, he began to sell the goats and horses to get money to buy more wine. Uncle Batani tried to reason with father, but he wouldn't listen to him. Now, George's spiral out of control breaks little Billy's heart. The boy, he clings to his lamb, hoping to hold on to his former life and memories with Uncle Batani. But his mentor eventually dies from illness a short time later. Mother loved him very much. And finally, after she had done everything she could to make him stop drinking, she gave up and went with him. <laughs> Now, alcoholism, it seldom affects just one person in a family. Nellie was one of the last pieces of glue trying to hold this family together. But unfortunately, she's succumbed to drinking as well. It was a sad day for us all. The day mother started to drink. Now, Billy here, he transforms into the older version of himself, who we will see for the rest of the film. The carefree younger Billy is gone now, but his older self dreams of bigger opportunities than are available to him on the reservation. Unemployment is high, and riding Broncos away from his childhood home could be his chance to see a better life. Look at Billy go. One winter while I was away, things went very hard on my family. Father and mother were drunk in town most of the time. Oland had a fever and was unable to get up. 
There was no food. My youngest brother and sister were starving. Now, Billy, he's not home right now. He's off riding Broncos. Mom and dad are drunk, and Uncle Batani, he's passed away. Things are perilous for the small children, especially when Billy's aunt gets sick. Luckily, the children, they find some abandoned food at a neighbor's home. Now, this is the lowest point of the movie. It seems like everything that can go wrong has go wrong. Now, gone wrong. Now, you may be wondering what any of this has to do with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I definitely don't blame you in asking that question. Because the church has not appeared, but it will do so shortly thanks to the church's so-called Indian Placement Program, also called the Lamanite Placement Program. It had its peak during the 1960s and 70s, where Lamanite, uh, Lamanite Native American students were placed in foster homes of LDS members during the school year or LDS-run boarding schools. The program was developed according to LDS theology, whereby conversion and assimilation to Mormonism could help Native Americans who had been classified as Lamanites in terms of theology from the Book of Mormon. An estimated 50,000 Native American children went through the program. Now, the foster uh, placement program was designed to intended to develop leaders among Native Americans and assimilate them into, into the majority uh, of white culture. The cost of care was generally borne by foster parents, although sometimes from the federal government and the church as well. Now, during this time, about 5,000 students uh, during the peak of the program participated in it. It started decreasing si in size in the 1970s, and it was eventually shut down. Now, I believe that uh, at this time that George here, he's not in a foster home at this time, but he's actually at a boarding school. Specifically, I think that he's at the boarding school at the Intermountain Indian School, which is near modern day Brigham City. Now here, he really longs to be home. He misses the time back um, with his family on the reservation, riding horses. Uh, that's what he really wants to go back to. Now, a key part of the Intermountain Indian School, which is where he's at right now, he's in the chapel that was built for that particular purpose. Um, that, that chapel was opened in 1956 and dedicated by President McKay himself and set apart as a chapel of worship, a house of learning and a house of recreation. By the late 1960s, about 200 Navajo students regularly attended the school that we just saw George at um, in this, inside that chapel, when the population of the school was about 2,200 students, the branch met in the Indian chapel that we saw that was specifically um, constructed and designed uh, for Navajo youth with attention to details, including Navajo rugs and interior decoration. Now, this school, it was eventually shut down in 1984, and it was demolished about 10 years ago. So that chapel that we saw it no longer exists. One of the reasons that the church got away or, or stopped the Indian placement program was, you know, that there was a lot of controversies that were associated with it. You know, when you look on the church's website today, there's very few articles on it. It's not something that the church really, um, really talks about much more, even though it ran for almost 40 years and had 50,000 people and it had its share of controversy as well. There was uh, allegations of abuse, including allegations of sexual abuse. But the church ran six known church uh, Indian schools at the time. Now, let's uh, go ahead and pick back up with the movie and Billy as he is being bused home from his boarding school in Brigham City. Finally, school was out. I was anxious to see my family. I was worried. I hadn't heard from them for a long time. Their letters had stopped coming. Now, um, he hitches a ride to get home. And unfortunately, he finds, he comes home and finds his small villages in absolute shambles. I find it a cute touch here that the filmmakers put in that he still remembers to run every day. But his home, it's deserted. His father is gone and only his aunt remains. Your father sold the last of the goats and went away. Our cousin said she had seen him with another woman, a bad woman from over the Black Mountain way. Your mother with the little ones with the relatives of our clan and went to look for your father. But where did she go? My son, only the four winds know where they are. I do not. But didn't they leave a message for me, their oldest son? They're proud of you, Billy, but ashamed of themselves, ashamed of what they have become. I'll find them and I'll make them come home. And we'll start over and be happy like in the old days. 
there will never be any old days. There is no going back. There is never any going back. That's one of the most devastating lines in the movie. Billy, he remembers the old happy days with Uncle Batani, but those days are gone forever. Now, he tries to find his family, but no one has seen them. And unbeknownst to him, his father is getting into a lot of trouble as he gets into a bar fight with a railroad man. He ends up getting arrested after a scuffle and arrested for a disturbance of the peace and spends time in jail. Father told me later that this was a turning point for him, as he remembered the bad days the wine had brought. Now, Billy, he is still searching for his family when he runs into the Mormon missionaries. And unbeknownst to him, his mother and father, they're estranged at this point. And Billy, he's so close to his mom, and he finds out that his mother has turned into a beggar. Even the Mormon missionaries won't give her loose change. Luckily, Billy is able to find his mother a short time later. Let me go. I'm not a good mother. I'm no kid. Do you think I'd let you go after looking all over the reservation for you? You're still my mother. Now his mother, she starts praying to God, uh, asking for the strength to become a better mother and to give up alcoholism and stop drinking wine, as she calls it. Eventually, Billy, he's also able to find his father, although his father at the time is in jail. But Billy, he posts his father's bond, and he's able to reunite his family in, uh, in a manner of speaking. Um, we're heading towards a happy ending. Both father and mother are still fighting against liquor. It will not be easy for them to find their lives again and turn to a better way. But with the help of our Father in Heaven, they can become the strong people they once were. Like Aunt Desba said, there will never be any old days again, and I know she speaks the truth. But maybe the new days will be better than the old. And that's definitely all that any of us can hope for. So this has 55,000 views on YouTube, making it one of the most popular of the Hard to Find Mormon videos. Now, thinking about the claim, disclaimer at the beginning, this video was intended for Navajos, Indians, and then persons of other races. So it really was intended for Native Americans. This film negatively reinforces stereotypes of Native Americans as drunk, brawling fighters, uncultured, needing white rescuing, and uh, also as beggars. Now the film, it doesn't just reinforce negative stereotypes, it also claims that white LDS prophets, they know best what Native Americans need. For instance, Spencer W. Kimball wrote in a personal letter that American Indians would not fully understand and embrace the gospel until they were removed from the deterrent influences of their traditions and upbringing. Now, sadly, however, there is a little bit of truth behind some of the film's stereotypes. Um, Navajo persons on the reservations, they were five times, they're five times as likely to die from alcohol related causes. They're still, they still suffer from a lot of them from crushing poverty, lack, lack of access to healthcare, high unemployment and shorter lifespans. Now in general conference, uh, Spencer Kimball, uh, he said in general conference that the children in the home placement program in Utah are often lighter than their brothers and sisters in the Hogan's on the reservations. There was a doctor in a Utah city who for two years had had an Indian boy in his home who stated that he was some shades lighter than the young brother just coming into the program from the reservation. These young members of the church are changing to whiteness and delightsomeness, end quote. So the real question is who should be telling the Navajo story. White Mormons like Spencer Kimball and Wetzel O. Whitaker, who produced this film, 
or the Navajos themselves. Now, Bitter Wind, it is not found on the church's film page uh, anymore, and it is definitely a truly to hard, hard to find video. Now, not every church uh, film portrays Native Americans through stereotypes. Tom Trails, which is a 17-part LDS film strip production, mostly designed for seminary students, shows Native uh, Indians in a neutral light or even a positive one. Now, some personal reflections that I can give to you from this film. Um, honestly, when I, came, when I chose to review this film, I was expecting another church-produced cringy whopper, but I have never been so wrong. I cried when I watched this film the first time. Alcohol is the bitter wind, wind uh, in the film and also in my own family's personal history. I have an older brother who's an alcoholic and has been for like 20 years, and if it wasn't for AA, he would – He'd still be an alcoholic, but luckily he's been sober for 10 years. And just like Billy and his uncle in the opening scenes of the short, I also spent a lot of time in the southern Utah wilderness with my father growing up. That's how I try to remember him. But on a deeper level, my LDS family, it was torn apart by my father's alcoholism and opioid abuse, which led to so much heartache and sorrow. Because of the bitter winds of drug and alcohol abuse, my father's internal organs failed and he passed away after years of dialysis while he was still relatively young. I still have a brother today who's just completely lost to alcoholism, who's basically homeless and estranged from most of his family. So some final thoughts. If you can forgive Bitter Wind's negative Navajo stereotyping and the Indian placement program and church's troubling history with native relations, you will discover in this movie a beautiful, simple tale of, humble, uh, of one boy's humble journey for peace and family reconciliation in our troubled world. Thanks so much for joining me to review The Bitter Wind. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment, and join us next time for another episode of the Mormon Movie Reviews where LDS movie lovers belong. So long.